This podcast is brought to you by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated, by the Diocese of Huron, a community where families and individuals from Windsor to Owen Sound, Grand Bend to Port Rowan, come together to worship and serve, and by Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. On this episode, we welcome back retired priest and author John Marsh. On this third visit, we chat about his book, Strangers at the Door, Perhaps the Reign of God. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be. We welcome you back. It's another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And uh, hey, we got a full house today. I'm glad yeah, look at this. You can Four be a people part of it. Look at that. Incredible. This is great. Wow. Yeah. My name's Rob Henderson, and I serve as the priest at Holy Trinity St. Stephen's in London, Ontario. Yes, he does. He's a good guy, too. You won't find a better guy than that. Uh, and I'm Kevin George. I hang out at uh, St. Aidan's Church in the northwest of London. And look who's back. Hello, my name is Ian. I'm a musician and the person who edits this podcast and sends it out to your ears. I hope you're doing okay out there. And look who's joining us from the West Coast early, who's here like, you know, three hours before we expect him. <laughs> that's that's John Marsh. Yeah. You were just sleeping? Still sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I'm still sleeping. <laughs> Well, get get yourself a coffee and uh, get a moving, John. We'll get to you in a few minutes, okay, buddy? And uh, yeah, we're glad that John's with us today. And uh, it's our uh, seventh episode of our eighth season here on the Vickers Crossing podcast. And today we are excited to welcome back, I think for the third time, um, John Marsh is uh, our guest today. John's a retired priest in the Diocese of uh, New Westminster, and John's been busy writing books since his retirement, and his latest is the one that we will be chatting about today. It is titled Strangers at the Door, Perhaps the Reign of God. And there's uh, Kevin for our YouTube watchers and listeners holding up the book, Strangers at the Door. So uh, John is our author, and he is here, and we will chat with him in a minute. All right. In the meantime, we want to uh, consider uh, our relationship with First Nations and the ways in which so many of us have benefited inordinately uh, because of our status as uh, descendants of, of uh, settler people. And so we acknowledge that the lands upon which we record this podcast from this end of the world are the traditional lands of the Anishabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenawayapak, and Attawandaram peoples and are connected with the London Township and somber treaties of 1796, and the dish with one spoon covenant wampum. These lands continue to be home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society, and people with whom we wish to walk uh, towards reconciliation, being mindful of the ways in which uh, we have perhaps benefited uh, and uh, the ways in which we need to unlearn so much mm -hmm. and relearn things that are new. We are very grateful for our sponsors here in the Vickers Crossing podcast who've been a great support to us, and we want to thank them right now. To A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated, and our good friend uh, Dave Mullen helping Dave. us uh, since, oh boy, lots of years ago when we got this thing underway, and he's been a great support, and we thank A. Miller George today. A. Miller George, deadly crowd over at the funeral home. Uh, we also offer our prayer, our uh, thanksgiving for uh, the Diocese of Huron uh, to Bishop Todd Townsend and the troop over there who support this podcast. Uh, the Diocese of Huron, a community where families and individuals from Windsor to Owen Sound, from Grand Bend to Port Rowan, come together in worship and service. And last, but certainly not least, you want to say a big thank you to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. And Trisha Lister was a wonderful human being over there who hooked us up with that. So thank yeah. you to them over there. They clean, they'll clean you up real nice. Yeah, have they gotten into that room of yours? Have they gotten into that room of yours or what? Uh, it's, it is a shame that I have my camera on right now. Oh, or my room is a mess. <laughs> we'll get Trisha. We'll make sure we take care of that. Trisha, here. Ian yeah. needs to clean up mile four. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
That's right. Well, good. I'm glad Ian's back and feeling better and we can all be together again. Kevin's going to pour himself an appropriate adult beverage to uh, to sip along on our podcast today. I'm drinking water. John is having an appropriate adult beverage as well. And Ian... Uh, I have tea. Tea. So Ian <laughs> and I, not the cool kids today <laughs> on the podcast, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I will say this, however. The reason John and I raise a glass today... Mm -hmm. It's a glass we're raising to you two gentlemen who just two days ago oh. <laughs> celebrated your birthday. So a happy birthday to Rob. That's right. Hey, thanks. And happy birthday <laughs> Thank to you. Ian. Happy thanks birthday, Ian. Happy yeah. birthday, Rob. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, Ian. I should also say a happy birthday to my younger brother, Brad, who turned 65 today. Okay, oh, all right. Perfect. So here you go. Perfect. Brad, yeah. Brad, you, you, some of you folks, listeners out there, will know the name Brad Marsh. He mm -hmm. played a little hockey in his day, over he a thousand did. games in the he NHL. Did. Wow. Uh, yeah. Philadelphia, Detroit, Toronto, Atlanta, Calgary, mm -hmm. Ottawa. Anywhere I missed, John? I think that got it. That yeah. got it all. When we were yeah. at the we were at the Briar, my wife and I and my sons went to the Briar in London a couple of weeks ago, and they've got all the banners mm -hmm. hanging from the yeah from, retired numbers. Yeah. And uh, Brad's one of them. And the guy next to me was talking to me about all these players that he'd heard of. And I, I said, yeah, well, kind of know that Brad guy, kind of, you know, but his brother yeah. is, uh, is and, acquainted and with me too. So that's pretty oh, he's cool. he's got a brother? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, you know, so, you know what's interesting? Cool. If, if, if you look at that, and you wouldn't say to look at him now, John's son was just in the background here for those of you watching on YouTube uh, and uh, Joshua. But the picture that's hanging in the rafters of Bradley uh, looks uh, remarkably like Josh did when he was about mm. 16 or 17. I mean, it's, oh, wow. it's, it's quite amazing. But anyway. That's cool. That's cool. Wow. So who is anyway. this? Who is this Harry Beast? John Marsh? Who is this from? Oh, well, this is uh, John Marsh, retired priest and uh, an author who's going to be chatting with us today. And his new book is uh, Strangers at the Door. I want to feel like I want to be singing a little Frank Sinatra, right? Yes. Strangers at, the, at door. the door. And John's here to talk about Back his about new book. Door. And we will chat uh -huh. on the Vickers Crossing. So, John, welcome. Uh -huh. Glad you're back. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, good to see you all. Good to be back. How's how's everything out in the van, Vancouver? Well, we've been blessed uh, for a while with uh, sunny days and 13, 14 degrees. But Ooh. unfortunately, today it's uh, raining, cloudy, and seven. Well, it must there be the is. whole must be the whole continent. Typical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, there you go. <laughs> Well, we're keeping John. Well, I suppose it is only twelve o'clock in BC. I was going to say we're keeping John from his office. His office is the local tavern, the local pub, which I'm sure he'll hit the tavern. Rob, this is what we have to look for forward to in retirement. I <laughs> do. We? Okay, I'm counting down the days. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good office to be in. Yeah. Yeah. I sense a Vickers Crossing pub along the way. Yes. Well, yes. Yes. <laughs> Why not? Right? We could have yeah. a, we could we could franchise them across the country. The, the retirement yeah. years, the Vickers yeah. Crossing. There's that's something cool. growing there. There is something growing. There's a lot of stuff growing around me, except hair. <laughs> All right. We want to talk about John's book, Strangers at the Door. Perhaps, perhaps the reign of God. Um, I want to start there, John, if we can, about the subtitle of this book, Perhaps the Reign of God. You set the tone early in the book when you outlined that the politics of the reign of God is not one of theocratic excess, but the politics expressive of a memory. And in talking about that, you write this, and I'll read this quote, question on the other side. The politics of the reign of God is marked by a madness of forgiveness, hospitality, generosity, and mercy in a world suffering under the disastrous concepts of power, sovereignty, and the lure of uh, omnipotence. The madness of the kingdom is not a separation of theology and politics, but an imagining, a reimagining, a thinking of theology differently, to think God differently, taking seriously the Sermon on the Mount and its expression of the power of powerlessness. God's reign, as we take it seriously, is to question the commitments, the lure, the draw of omnipotence underlying the concept of sovereignty. The politics of God's reign is an engagement with the theopoetic call of the other to love those who don't love you, to love the unlovable, to commit the excess, to commit to an excess of love. You go on, John, to say that this reign of God is not a political blueprint, but I really love this image you give, but you, when you say it's more a way or more accurately ways to mark up a blueprint, and you use uh, quite craftily the notion of a red pen, sort of like red letter Christians, but 
a, a pointing to the luring within the story or the stories. Can you say more about the possibility of the reign of God? Well, I'll begin as a start off point um, with your mentioning about marking up a blueprint. Uh, many years ago, um, I was in a parish actually in London, Ontario. We were putting on a, an addition to the building. And, um, you know, the blueprint showed that the one bathroom was supposed to be a bathroom that was accessible to those who have various kinds of disabilities. And when I read the me measurements of the door frame on the bathroom, it struck me that it was way too narrow. In other words, it was a standard door frame. Mm -hmm. So we had to mark up those blueprints and say, hey, guys, come and pay attention to this. You have not paid any attention. You're proposing to build an accessible washroom that nobody can actually get in. And so I, I think that's really what is the lure of the reign of God is that we're called to pay attention to the context of the world. We're called to pay attention to whatever is going on around us. Um, and by that, I mean, paying attention on a global level, yes. but to use the old thing, like to, you've got to act locally and think globally. Mm -hmm. So you've got to pay attention uh, to wherever you are in whatever context you're in and say, you know, what would it mean to take very seriously the reign of God, which is a call, uh, a lure to take seriously hospitality, to take seriously justice, to take seriously inclusion? And what would it mean, wherever I am, to take that very seriously? Now, I can't be more specific than that because I don't mm -hmm. know where people are. Right. But I do know that if you pay attention to your local and take the call of God as it stirs within the, within what we call the reign of God, if you take that very seriously, you're going to be engaged to begin to move out into the world, into your neighborhoods, into meeting the people who are around you uh, and surround you, and in fact, are you. Yeah, you know, just to follow up on that before I get to my next question, I was recently speaking with a bunch of new ordinance, um, and we were talking about this in terms of, I was asked to go to talk about preparing for preaching and and for liturgy in in context in terms of connecting to a, a being a community which connects with the neighborhood and with the people around it um and it seemed to me that a part of the challenge for some of those participating in that as new ordinance was the continued desire to bifurcate uh the church and the world uh or the secular yeah. and the sacred I, I, and and there was a real sort of discomfort uh, and I think that that's something we see in the church a bit. I mean, do you have any reflection on that, John? Um, well, this attempt to continue to bifurcate, which is the what we, we like to put in opposition, is the sacred and the secular. Yeah. The opposite to the sacred is not the secular. Mm. The opposite to the sacred is the profane. Mm -hmm. And 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 in fact, when and, and a lot of times when we we engage in that which we think is religious. We're engaged in really profane activities, so much so that it becomes a profanity. Right. Um, in in other words, you, you have to begin to recognize. I think this is a take I uh, I take on on the road to Emmaus story. You know, where in the breaking of bread they realized Jesus was amongst them and all that kind of stuff. But I think luring deeply within that narrative, which is a a, a fun narrative to read. Yeah. Um, it's a recognition that that every table is sacred and is yeah. in fact an altar. Mm. But at the same time, it's also a reminder that every altar is but a table. Mm -hmm. In a, mm. there's this blending, this bleeding into each other, in which you know we, they each mutually reinforce each other without taking away their uniqueness. Yeah. And and one of the things we've done in the past is when we used to run meal programs out of because the church had, you know, everything could move about. And so yeah. the only real space we had was to use the what what most people would call the sanctuary as, yeah. as where we would serve our food. And so we would set tables up and food would be served. But then in the middle of the room uh, uh, and we always had our altar for liturgy in the middle of the room we would have the altar set up. And it, it's a way of saying that these tables in which people are eating whatever is being served that day is not anything different than that altar. And that yeah. altar is nothing different than that table. Yeah. And, and if we begin to say, well, somehow we're diminishing the sacredness of the altar, yeah. 
you're fundamentally revealing that you're caught up in that bifurcation yes that you talked about and again uh, i think that is actually a profanity it yeah. is a profanity that the church keeps perpetuating and uttering over and over and over again needlessly uh, yeah. because it's it's to our advantage to recognize that we are in and of the world and we have to stop giving ourselves over to the profane and 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 calling profanity sacred yeah well it's be, I, I enjoy i love that because i think um you know we only have one world and that's the one we're in i mean this sort of notion that there's some fairyland I mean, it's crazy anyway I, I digress i'll go off to my next question which in the introduction of the book john at the outset you pose a very important question and let me share this quote question on the other side you pose the question so what do i love when i love god or better put or can to continue so what do i love when i love god or justice or hospitality or freedom or generosity or life my question you write should indicate that i follow a peculiar religion this peculiar religion which possesses me, this religion in which the name is not of central importance, but rather the work being called for and in under in and in under the name. This name is not a signifier of a being, does not require any being to initiate to finish the work. This name is the name of an existent being, but of a this pardon me, this is the name not of an existent being, but of a haunting insistence, which while not existent, to focus on existence is a distraction, a distraction from the work. So to go back, this haunting insistence, which is not existent, is made real in the response of being called for and in and under the name. Could you say more about this God who John Caputo uh you've noted a lot in the book says this god doesn't exist but this god insists yeah i mean to pick i mean that's a caputo's wonderful way of of putting it very briefly that god does not exist god insists i mean and 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 the language that i talk about it means to take the name of god what happens in and under the name of god to take that very seriously but to take that seriously doesn't mean you have to pause it or mm. even pretend that there's this existent being floating around somewhere. It, what it means to say is, is that whatever is going on within the name of God cannot be contained by the name. Mm. Like it exceeds the name. So that's why, you know, you can say God, or you can say hospitality, you can say freedom, you can say love, you can say, you know, all of those things. And whatever is going on within those names exceeds what those names can actually present and, and, and express. Um, I I take that very seriously. And I, I take being one who's been ordained since Moses roamed the earth, um, I, I take the name of God very seriously while at the same time getting incredibly annoyed by how the name of God is actually abused and used within many ecclesial circles. Mm -hmm. So it, it's to recognize that there's a call being ushered or, or being issued uh, under and within and in the name of God that we're trying to pay attention to and trying to respond to. Mm -hmm. Not engaged in endless, pointless uh, uh arguments about the existence of god or this as soon as you raise that question you're asking the wrong question and, and i'll put it to you this way if you read sacred narratives in a in a kind of fun and theopoetic way you you get god what, what god is often talked about in in terms of movement there's a lot of movement going on and that wonderful passage in exodus when moses says you know i want to i want to see you i want to see you and God says, "Well, I'll put you up in this in this crag in the in in the rock, and and I'll pass by. When I pass by, you can look and you can see my hind quarters. <laughs> in other words, yeah. seeing God's ass. Yeah. But I, I I love that because it's that we we never actually directly perceive that which we name as God. Whatever it is we sense, God has already left the room. Yeah." God has already moved on, and what we're seeing is the the traces, the the signs that something here 
was was going on something and that something calls us and and it uh, puts a claim on our on our hearts and puts a claim on how we should respond to life so i take that very seriously but i don't and now we're moving into belief statements which are really the province of having a conversation in a pub i i i not i'm not interested in whether you believe in god or not that's irrelevant mm. and so i try to sidestep but what i want to say is what are you being called to what are you being what is what is being disturbed within you yeah within that name and take that seriously so i don't care whether you use the name god whether you need the name hospitality or justice or freedom um any and we can continue the list they're all interchangeable they're all usable and they all fall short of of expressing the excess that is yeah. at work within the name yeah yeah in the second chapter of your book now i don't want to spoil too much A spoiler um, alert <laughs> in the second chapter of your book you draw the reader's attention to dailiness uh you write mm -hmm. it's time to attend to the prayer your right. kingdom come uh, you describe this as a prayer for now not for some hoped for heavenly future um and we'd like to ask you to read us a section of that chapter and then uh, on the other side we'll have a, a question and then uh you can answer the question or not I, he ideally can choose to do, <laughs> he can choose to do whatever the hell yeah. he wants he's a cantankerous <laughs> old bugger i gotta you know, yeah. yeah you want me to read it now yes, yeah please. read it now you cantankerous old bat well, that's true. <laughs> okay, let me uh, try to get my pos self positioned. I'm trying to get my glasses working here. The dailiness of life is to attend to time so as not to crowd out God. The dailiness of life is to attend to the giftedness of time in which we learn, open to, letting God be God in us as Meister, Meister Eckhart said. This is not to blow plans, daily calendars out the window. It is to so condition them as to allow for things to turn on a dime. In the reign of God, living sensitive to the kingdom is allowing for impossible draws on us, those breaks, interruptions of schedules. If I had it said, once it has been said hundreds of times sorry to interrupt your work <laughs> truth to tell when i'm at my best or at least not at my worst the interruptions are my work yes i have this and that to do but i also need to attend to you attending to you may interrupt my plans but my prayer, my hope, is that my plans not always trump you. To attend to the givenness of time is to work and to plan for tomorrow, but also to endeavor not to worry, not to fixate or obsess. This worrying, this not worrying, but an attending an openness to the calls of the impossible. Obviously, we will attend to this imperfectly, yet try we must, recognizing that while economy cannot be avoided, the question is always about how to approach it. Economy, plans, programs, processes are a part of life, but they are not sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. They are to be continually interrupted for their health and perhaps for ours. Remember, the Sabbath was made for us, not we for the Sabbath. Mm. These interruptions may be events of the impossible, called for by the impossible, perhaps prayers for the impossible. It is not a matter of structuring a middle position between plans and interruptions. It is a matter of living in the grip of the impossible of living, give us this day, living all in mm. this day, letting tomorrow take care of itself. 
To live dailiness is not a passive reception of whatever happens, a valorizing of a laissez-faire attitude as a pious pair posture. Dailiness is living each day with a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. Living dailiness is not a patient waiting for the fruition of a 10 or a five-year plan, <laughs> but to attend to impossible calls this day, recognizing that our work will not be completed this day, allowing one to be disturbed by open-ended calls. Love it. That, that's so real. Uh, it's, it's, real. it's, it's so easy to get caught up in, oh, I need to do this in the, the next week or the next month, or I have this to plan and all of these, but try to, trying to live in that dailiness is so important. I think it's very and, Zen. It's very yeah, Zen. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, it's, I think, I think we naturally want to think about what you're going to be or, and continue on forward, but taking that time for the day is, is so important. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, the relating this back to the podcast, um, the church and, and how, how, how do you think John, the the church would look if it were to embrace this dailiness this zen that that you write about in this passage and the living daily with that sense of urgency that you also write about in in five words or less <laughs> we'll give you we'll Go. give you we'll give you a 60 or so we'll, we'll mark it out of 10 and see what happens <laughs> well well listen let me let me just respond by way of introduction um you all know when when you've met somebody who purports to be, I'm always open to the now. I'm always open to whatever's going to happen. I'm always open. I can just just respond immediately. And you actually know you're talking to somebody who's just full of shit. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Because what what it means is that they're just not recognizing that they're confused. They live in a mess. And they don't want to admit the mess. They they just live in a whirlwind of activity and nothing actually ever really happens, never really gets done. It's just like spinning your wheels. And and those of you living in Ontario or anywhere where there's snow know what it means to spin your wheels. And you know, it's, it's a lot of energy being expended, a lot of smoke going on, but nothing happens, nothing moves. Um, I'm gonna that that's not what I'm talking about at all. No. Um, be, to be truthful, even though I, I wrote what I just read, I am a person who I, I write lists every day. I mean, I write down what I want to try to accomplish. I write down so what you, I need to try to remember. So you're very I, Jay. You're very Jay on that uh, Myers Briggs uh, thing. Huh? Uh, uh, I am, and yet I'm not captured by that because I recognize that most of the moments happen in 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 a way that is often surprising. Right. Um. Now I can answer the question by way of a of, of, of a story, if you wish. Sure. Um, sure. This is a, a story that comes at the end of my third book, which is called On Edge. He he um, uh, he titled that in uh, in the tribute to me because I live my life on edge. <laughs> That's right. The walking. So it, it's from the <laughs> from the very end of the book called On Edge at the Boundaries of the Church. And it's a, a it, it it's it's a story I wrote. So I'll just read it, and and I'm not offering this as an answer. It is a story. You take from it what you will, and uh, we'll go from there. As the book comes to to an end, I drift into sleep. As I sleep, I dream, and dreaming. I was walking along a shadowed valley road. The road was teeming with people, all on the move, young and old, all sorts and conditions, moving, some looking forlorn, others laughing, others engaging in the precious trivialities of intimacy, mm. still others creeping along in the elbowed dance of life, elegant, elastic. 
as a, a mass of people all on the move. There were tall ones, short ones, brown ones, round ones, white ones, crazy ones. As we walked through the valley, the road began to descend deeper between the hills on either side. As it leveled, there was before me the largest tent I had ever seen. It was immense. As our throng inched closer, I noticed that the tent had no walls. And as far as the eye could see, people were streaming in and out around the edge of the tent. As we approached closer still, some entry points possessed a sort of rhythm to the flow. Most, however, were marked by a more frenzied flow, a messy dance of in and out. Carried by the flow, I came to the edge of the big top, and entering in, I saw a large table, a rather ordinary table. It was laden. Looking up and down the perimeters of the tent, I saw there were other tables dotting the edge. Most were rather ordinary tables, some high, some low, some with chairs, some without. Yet here and there, there was a fancy table, fancy in design and ornamentation. All of the tables were laden with foods of all kinds breads and wines, meats and vegetables, all prepared in varieties of ways with varieties of spices. As the breeze blew in and through the open walls of the tent, the smells and aromas were carried aloft, mixing in a melange of spicy fragrance, the world carried by the wind and contained in a sniff. As I looked at the table in front of me, I saw some eating, some getting takeout. Off to the sides, deliveries were being prepared and carried away by those moving in and out. Approaching the table, I was invited to sit and eat and nibbling on something wonderful yet unknown. I noticed that there was more than the table, the table, but part of a large, open air kitchen with food being prepared by all sorts and conditions of people, some in a semblance of order, others more the mess of organized chaos. Around the tables with kitchens ever working were clumps of other people, honeycombs of other activities, some engaged in education, in others needs and wounds being attended, some being clothed, some cleansed, some giving solace, others still praying in varieties of forms and techniques, varieties of languages, some prayers sung, some others said, with, well, with those praying, those working at times changing places. Occasionally, those being assisted, assisted in the work, mm -hmm. at times joining in the prayers. As I looked, most of the in, most in the tent were around the edge, people ever on the move, all transpiring within a tidal movement of people and goods ever in flux. Moving from the table, the kitchen, and the surrounding beehive of activity, I wandered deeper inside the tent. From the chaos of the edge, I walked toward the center of the tent. And as I moved, the numbers reduced. Movement slowed and calmed. A certain quiet stillness replacing the edginess of the cacophony of sound around the perimeters. The further in one went, silence and solemnity grew grew in its allure, yet I remained uncertain, unsure if I was being lured by a calm still point or the quiet of death. As I continued to move, I noticed that some in their quiet resolve had stopped, while others were drawn almost inexorably further in. 
as I was drawn to the center, I suddenly realized that in my movement, I was but one observing. Approaching the center point, some stuck, moving no further. Others in the center were there, but then not there, as if the ground beneath had given way. As I moved to the center, I had a sense that I was dreaming, a dream within a dream. And I found myself back at the edge as one praying, then as one working at table, then one learning, healing, and being healed. Being so involved, I noticed a similar dance around me, some fed, now feeding some clothed, now clothing, some taught, now teaching, some helped, now helping. As I moved out from under the tent top, I found myself with a group outside packing, packing all manner of things, and I asked what they were doing. We're moving on out. Out where? Out to the edges where the roads lead. Why? We're moving out because we are, we're spooked by one haunting us, a specter calling us to go beyond the edge to do there what is being done here. I was about to move on when they asked if I could give them a hand. Could you help us load our last item, our rain canopy? I grabbed one edge of a large rectangular box, helping to maneuver it onto its transport. And as they gave one final push, I caught a glimpse of its packing label. Item, one rain canopy, manufacturer, Yeshua and company. Mm. I awoke, haunted, disturbed as madness seized me. Wow. So you can... Uh, that's that's what I have to say. I have no prescription for the church. I have no list of ten things to do to find viability, sustainability, <laughs> or, or anything. Thanks be to God for that. Yeah. Uh, all I try to do is to issue a call to take hold of the madness. I, I as always claim me, and that madness I sense. Mo one of its most powerful articulations is within the reign of God. Mm. Just, I like, I, I, sorry, Ian, I was just going to say, I just love the notion of uh, those who had been fed, taught, helped, um, yeah, brought mm -hmm. in, doing same. the thing going forward. Yeah, doing the same. For yeah. us, yeah. You, you wouldn't say that this is the same feeling as, I don't know if it was a feeling, but you wouldn't say this is the same thing as, as the idea of like God having a plan for everyone, would you or no? uh it, it i well getting back to you know what i believe <laughs> i i i i know i don't believe uh that god has a plan for everybody in fact to begin to state that is to begin to go down a road that i think that lends leads to endless complications and needless conundrums mm. but i've i've had what that story was attempting to articulate as poorly as it did was to, I've always been haunted by the church as this kind of gigantic big tent yeah. reality. That's not so much concerned that whether you carry a membership card, that's no. not really concerned whether you can say the 12 magic words that'll mm. lead you to the table. That's not concerned about whether you're, you got the right color or the right gender or the right this or the right that. They're yeah. paying attention to what is before them. What is the need? What yeah. do people require? What is going on? And that in the meantime, in, in and through all of that, whatever it is that we want to say we need to pray, whatever yeah. it is that we want to say we need to celebrate, whatever that it is that we want to try to claim as something sacred is interwoven and is growing out of that. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I was trying to give some voice to within that right. story. Right. Um, yeah. so. And as, and I, what I heard was as the observer, 
you're observing the dailiness that you're talking about. That's what I was. It's it's about paying attention. So yeah, yeah. If I if it may offer, I mean, I've used this story a lot because I'm an old guy and I tend to be repetitive. You know, so it's you very, know, I can get, testify. Get, he's old. He's very old. Get used to that. He's but so old. He's thing. so old. He farts dust. I'm just there we you. go. <laughs> but it, it's the same thing as the day I I. I accepted someone into sanctuary we ended up being there for four years i mean when the day began i had no clue that that was going to happen when the day mm -hmm. began i had no idea how it was going to be ending when the day ended i had no understanding at all that this had, i had just committed the entire community to a four-year commitment of work <laughs> yeah, right. yeah i had yeah. no <laughs> awareness of any of it yeah. but i paid attention to something and i still can't explain exactly why i did it because i had turned it mm. down many times before and uh, perhaps for good reasons you know uh but there was something in that moment there was something in that phone call there was something that presented me that struck me said i can't and i won't turn this down i will not turn this down right. and i have no right. clue what's going to happen right there it is yeah. it, it's an expression of the kind of thing that i'm getting at yeah. It doesn't always have to be dramatic, committing yourself to a four-year fight with the federal government. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not that's not the point. I mean, it it can be something as to pay attention. My uncle, who was a man who um, led a storied life, but often found himself on the edges of existence. You know that he didn't have a job; he had no way of ma making money. Well, one of the things he grew up with, I think I've told this story before too, but he grew up that he could always go to the church. And they would help him. And, and I remember him saying with some disgust, he said, you know, John, I went to the church so many times and I asked for help. I needed some food. I needed $5. And he said, you know what? I got treated like a piece of crap. Mm. Yeah. Now, does that mean that everybody in the church treats others like a piece of crap? No. Yeah. But it is an expression that surely to God, we're called to something that's a little more daring and a little more responsive than treating someone as a statistic that we refuse to give our time to. Right. I, I just think that in it, like in contrast to your story, and then I'll shut up because Rob's got a question, but I, <laughs> is, uh, you know, we recently had a workshop here in this deanery around safety and security, which I was very uncomfortable with the whole language. I mean, I, I like I, I've been at the mosque on Fridays where there are police hired by the mosque and bollards in front of doors because there are real safety and security concerns. What we're talking about here are broken uh, windows, broken windows <laughs> and stolen laptops. Right. And at, at this recent meeting, a warden of a prominent downtown church said, well, we found a solution to this because we can't have these people like your uncle, John, we can't have these people. We once the Eucharist starts, once we begin the service, we lock the door. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. they locked the door. Yeah. They locked the door yeah. and they put guards yeah. at the door and yeah. then they decide who gets in and who gets out. Right. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, that's a very different image than this tent that you describe mm -hmm. with many points of entry and people coming and going and this freedom, uh, this liberation. Again, I want to affirm that. I mean, but I, I want to affirm it in the sense of, of taking note of the complexity of the situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in a mm -hmm. similar situation, I was uh, friends with uh, a, a local rabbi here. And um, we were going to do a piece of work together. And I had to go meet him at the synagogue. And, you know, I had to buzz in and I had to go through, um, yeah. you know, like it's like at the airport, yeah. you know, to be checked yeah. for weapons. And, and I, I, I reacted to it in all, in all, almost involuntarily. And I was about to say something. I said, this, this is a problem until I'd realized that the reason that it was there yeah. is that they had a history of anti-Semitic attacks on the synagogue yeah. and the previous synagogue had been burned to the ground yeah. and people killed. Yeah. So I thought, OK, I got to keep my mouth shut because what we're called to in that is not it's not responding to the call of hospitality and the unconscious well we've been commanded to do it so we just do it you've got to take the risk of making decisions and if you're not taking the risk of making a decision you're abdicating your responsibility to pay attention to the call of hospitality Amen. because we live we there's no absolutes we cannot be absolutely safe nor are we absolutely you know thrown to hell in the handbasket 
you have we live in between that yes we live in the in-between time it's in the in-betweenness and the in-betweenness calls us to have to make decisions right. but and this crit but is critical but to always be open to having the decision that we've made to be open to critique yeah right, right. you well, have my, it, it's not an it's not a comfortable place to be well my butt is always open over to you rob <laughs> okay um, I'm going to go off script a little bit because I, this it feels to me like um, being attentive to what we're talking about and observing this. Um, yeah. I'm going to jump ahead a question because I had a couple, but my second one was about um, the chapter on hospitality in, in, in John's book. So I thought let's segue into that because it fits what we're talking about. Um, so another great chapter of the book on hospitality, John, and at the beginning of the book, you write about the reign of God being inscribed on bodies real bodies, mm -hmm. not uh, ethereal, heavenly, idealized bodies, um, not on the perfect bodies, but uncommon bodies, those that embody difference, some uh, large, some small, some larger, some lighter, twisted, harmed, suffering, objectified bodies. And you write about the reign of God as a gathering of the ungathered um, and you write that the work of sacred hospitality, and this is quoting from, from the book, that the work of sacred hospitality is of particular importance in our time as crimes against hospitality are endured by refugees, wayfarers, and wanderers held in camps, camped out at border crossings, working illegally in constant feel, fear of deportation. Truth to tell, the conditions of suffering are many and varied. Politics today often turns on waging war, demonizing those other that are other as rogues, drug dealers, and rapists. Think Trump. We're getting a lot more of that next this week too. <laughs> um, there is a mu there is much riding on whether the descendants of ancient Israel can welcome the Palestinian other, or whether the Christian West is to welcome those Muslim, or whether there is room in the hearts, dare I say, the communities of those comfortably off for those whose um, desires of the comfort of work. Biblical stories of somewhat mad wedding feasts where those from the highways and the byways are invited are not to be written off, sermonized into sentimentality mm -hmm. as they haunt the politics of our times. Is it possible that refugees, exiled and displaced, burdened people of all sorts are very biblical figures, mm. figures with nowhere to lay their heads. Isn't something similar said of Yeshua? Figures haunting religious people, mm. inviting their response, inviting their considered response. So this seems an important reminder to us as we hear this you know, constant din of conservative voices calling for tougher borders and higher walls. Last week, big story in Canada was the closing of Roxham Road amidst pressure from um, governments in Quebec and Ontario. And today, we, this past few days, we've heard the news story of the recovery of six bodies from the St. Lawrence River. And those bodies were of two families from Romania and India who were trying to enter the U.S. So I guess the question, John, is, again, can you comment on how, again, we as church speak a new language, which is that of the stranger? What's that look like for us? I think it, it, it begins by having us to admit the complexity of the problem, that there is no easy, no easy answer. There is no clearly defined and articulated solution to all of this. We're going to find out how we respond to it by engaging in constant, ongoing, and upfront conversation, where we're not being duplicitous sons of bitches. Excuse uh, my language. Um, <laughs> We, we, we like there's no like it to to deal with refugees or the stranger there's like there, when we took someone into 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 uh, uh sanctuary um, one of the groups that wanted to come alongside us and use us to the parish as a way of trumpeting their political cause was nobody is illegal no one is illegal well the problem is you can't make a blanket statement like that for the realities in which we live uh th there are people that uh, i think we probably should try to not allow within a country the problem though is not that we keep those almost everyone would agree we don't want in 
The problem is that we're not willing to have the difficult, painful conversation about a, a way of allowing people in that will enrich our country, enrich our own lives, enrich our own selves. It is a complex issue. Um, and we like to, 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 to take things down to their simplified form, which is usually what we see in the bifurcation of things and, and you know, this and that, you know, right and wrong. It's, it's, a simple, it's a simplified and simplistic way of looking at stuff. Um, so we need to engage in, in an ongoing conversation about politically what it may mean. I mean, there's, there's little point for the church to send off pious platitudes condemning X, Y, and Z to the government when recognizing that no one in the government really gives a damn. They don't mm. even read it. They don't care. But it does say something when we're willing to work together with government in order to be perhaps it's goad, perhaps it's irritant to say, you got to take this stuff seriously. There is no immigration policy on the planet that is not beyond critique that does not need to be opened up. Moving away from the, the question of refugees, which is a pressing uh, question for anybody in North America right now, but a pair of politic, particularly for people down south of us. But it's, it's how you open up to people in your own neighborhood. OK, one of the things that um, I remember being brought home and they were absolutely right, they said, well, why are you letting in somebody uh, as a refugee from elsewhere? Right. Well, we got p people who are internal refugees, to which I had to say, you're absolutely right. There are internal refugees here. There are people who have really nowhere to lay their head. There are people here who have nothing. And I know, Kevin, you mentioned this in a conversation the other day. You saw bubbles. Mm hmm. So Bubbles is a guy who lives in a tent mm -hmm. down, well, you know where he, you can say, anyway, lives down in a tent. Just, you know, in just down the road from the church here. And 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 we met uh, Bubbles in a, in a, what was it, a A and W. A and W, yeah. And, and, and Kevin thankfully bought him some breakfast. But it's, it can, and, and he earns his money by, you know, asking for change. It's really easy to treat this guy as an annoyance, as a lazy SOB, as a problem, you know, but he's a human being and he's trying to survive. Who's obviously got a really complex history be behind him, but we got to try to see a person as a person, not as a problem. Um, the uh, uh, I had a point, but it left my no, head entirely. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, good. No, that's great. I, I want to circle back to to one of the other questions I wanted to ask you about the book. Um, specifically the fourth chapter of the book. And for those of us that follow the common lectionary in church land a couple of weeks ago, we just did the story of Lazarus and the raising of Lazarus. And uh, you write about this in, in that fourth chapter, dead man walking. Mm. Um, and you speak Helen about Prejan, Helen Prejan. Eh? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You speak about the story as one, one that suggests what might be a truth calling um, inviting a risky effort to make truth real an effort to honor a possible emergence of life, the impossibility of hope, hoping against hope, that within the world of limitations, perhaps deeply within, an event may be harbored, stirring the call, the calling of the unconditional. And one of the pieces of that story that people often pick up on is the reference to, you know, Jesus weeping, Jesus wept. That's always a, a question in Bible trivia. You ever get that? What's the shortest passage in the Bible? Jesus wept. Um, but you write about tears, and I'll share this piece um, from the book. You write, if no tear is to be lost, hope transpires in or unleashes another time, a time of rebirth, resurrection, and salvation. With rebirth, resurrection, or salvation, tears are not required to be removed or dried up, but remembered, mm -hmm. not to avenge, putting a price on the priceless, to exchange a life for a life, but remembered to hope through the tears for a resurrection or a rebirth. Mm -hmm. Tears witness to a hope for a new time, not the present moment pinning us to a wall of suffering. This new time, a salvation from the present. Salvation is not compensation, but ruined time given a new life. The repair of ruined time is going through irreparable loss without losing the loss demanding 
not as the laborer demands their wage, but as death demands, wishes for rebirth or resurrection. Hope within tears transpires in or unleashes, perhaps, the poetics of the event, of the impossible, at work within the time of the kingdom. This work, a theopoetic logic of rebirth and resurrection, in which we shift into another time, a messianic time. Messianic time applies not only to sin and forgiveness, but to suffering and rebirth, time in which we get a new start, pardoned, released from evils suffered and committed. Salvation as new time is a continuation of the work of creation as imagined by the priestly author, where Elohim looks upon creation, declaring it to be good. Mm. We're in Holy Week this week, Good Friday coming up, and there will no doubt be a lot of talk of sacrificial atonement from many of our pulpits. God, when was... we consider the notion of what lies in the possibility of tears, what might the possibilities be for us as we consider the crucifixion this week? I love these really simple questions you ask, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. it's, it's, um, John, we learned about simple questions from you. Yeah. That, well, I'm, I'm simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have, well, first of all, uh, uh, I, I, I approach the topic of the crucifixion with a certain amount of fear and trembling um, because I know it's power. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know there's a, a kind of, it's understood that there's an almost inexorable logic to it that will just begin to say, to put it bluntly, steamroll us. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we can almost say, what is the point of the crucifixion? And you can almost hear it coming off everybody's tongue that catechetical response yes. you know I, I i all i want to say is by by way of intro to answering your question is that the crucifixion is 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 a powerful powerful trope within our sacred narratives and there is no one right way of answering it there's no convenient way of answering it um a lot of it is contextually held and so there, that there are ways that in a certain context, certain understandings or interpretations may rise up and have a little more oomph to them than in other contexts. It's not my desire to blow them all out of the water, although I think that some of them are seriously, seriously, seriously problematic and perhaps need to be left behind for, at the very least, a good period of time. But I will say this by way of response is that the, the crucifixion is a slash and a cut. It is not a, a clean, dainty picture. Uh, it is a slash and a cut across all of our institutions, all of our ideologies, all of our structures, all of the things we've managed to organize. And we need it to allow it to be that. On, on The cross is one of those iconic stories in which the, the killing of Jesus, the political killing of Jesus, it was a political killing. God did not desire him dead. God did, God did not intend him to be dead. That is not the point. It's a serious misreading of the story. It was a political killing because he was saying something too close, too cutting, and too disturbing to the powers that be. Mm -hmm. Who were the powers that be? Well, obviously, the most dominant power that was at that time was the Romans, but there were other political players involved. So it was a political killing, just like the lynching of Black people in the, in the South was a political killing, just like any number of things that are similar. So I, I, the, the cross, on the cross, Jesus became an icon of the reign of God. He died to and for the reign of God without betraying his life. He did not betray his life at all. And that's held, uh, held up in one again that very brief passage within the within the various um, 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 narratives of the crucifixion, 
and where he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Mm. That forgiveness uttered, uttered from the cross, as we have it in one narrative form, is, I think, encapsulates, I think, the disturbing dynamic and madness of the reign of God. Jesus is an icon of all of those throughout history who have ever suffered any unjust killing, any mm. killing due to hatred, uh, 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 racism, like anything. Jesus is an icon of that. And perhaps his voice rings out. And and so it, 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 that uh, I will say this, I, I use uh, in at times the uh, example of Emmett Till. Of course, one could use George Floyd. Mm hmm or countless others. I mean, Breonna Taylor. I mean, all yeah. of these people who have been killed, executed, let's just use the word, they've been executed yeah. uh, for varieties of reasons. But Emmett Till is one that uh, I grew up with is because he was killed in the year I was born. Um, but Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy who lived in Chicago and went down to visit his family in uh, the South, uh, it was either Alabama or Mississippi, can't remember now. Anyway, he committed, so they said, the cardinal sin of uh, whistling at a white woman, Yeah, which he didn't do. The white mm -hmm. woman actually recanted her testimony decades later. Yeah, And what they did is they, they kidnapped him in the middle of the night, they tortured him, they mm -hmm. beat the living crap out of him mm -hmm. and um and and they eventually uh, killed him when they found his body his body was so brutalized that it was grotesque and you can actually go and see pictures of it the reason we have pictures of it because his mother insisted yeah that the casket be left open mm -hmm. not because she wanted to um you know valorize violence but because she wanted to display mm -hmm. the effects of violence. And um, and so we have these pictures. And I'll put it to you this way. Emmett Till's voice rose higher than those voices who condemned him and beat him to death yeah. in that moment. That's not to valorize his death. It's not to give any justification for his death. It's not to say his death actually, in a sense, in an economic way, saves us from anything. But his death calls to us. So Emmett Till rose higher in that moment that out his voice outstripping the voices of those who killed him. Yeah. A tank man. You know who Tank Man is? Mm -hmm. The guy who stood in front of a tank at the uh, occupation of Tiananmen Square in, I think it was 1989. Tank Man never rose so high as when he stood tall mm -hmm. in front of a tank. And we have no idea what happened to him. He's gone. He's dead. Rosa Parks never stood so tall as when she sat down for justice. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that is encapsulated by the cross. It is a <clears throat> excuse me it is a call to us to pay attention to the crucified of the world and the crucified of the world are all around us sometimes the crucified of the world are deeply buried within us we have to pay attention to it and and the thing i'll put it to you this way much of the transactional interpretations that we give the cross in which it is in which it is an economic exchange in which we Jesus buys our, our 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 freedom because of our terrible terrible sins. That <laughs> just that is a complete cheapening of the cross. It it is a desecration of the cross. It is a desecration of the life of Yeshua. It is a desecration of of what the reign of God is calling us to do. It is a desecration of life itself. Yeah. So again, I. You know, I'm not trying to give you the definitive response to the cross. Um, mm. I've, I've got a book coming out in a couple of days <laughs> that will won't give you the definitive <laughs> <laughs> expression of that. But it is. A, I think the cross is a, is 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 the kind of final event in the life of someone who embodied and who preached and who died for the reign of God. 
Yeah. And I think as I listened, like uh, that piece that, uh, that Rob shared about tears, uh, and I think about much of what you're saying, and as I've heard you talk about it before in terms of the crucifixion um, and a passion story in general, I guess, probably a better put. Um, you know, and I couldn't help, but when I read it again, I was rereading your book in preparation for today. And I read that bit about tears and I was reminded of my grandmother and I was, I was thinking of an episode of, and it did much, you know, a smaller episode than a big injustice, but I don't even know why I was shattered, but I was shattered. You know, I was a shattered human being. I was maybe 15, 14, sitting on the end of my bed, weeping uncontrollably over whatever was going on in my life. And my grandmother, uh, who was a devout old Salvationist in those days, raised an Anglican, became a Salvationist. And she had her little walker. And in those days, the walkers didn't have the wheels, right? So you could hear her coming, clunk, clunk, <laughs> clunk, clunk. And so she, she came walking into the bedroom. And she sat down next to me, and she didn't say a word for like three minutes. And I just wept. And then she finally put her hand on my lap. And she tapped me a couple times and she got up and she kissed my forehead and she said, Kevin, tears are the enemy of the devil. You go ahead and cry. Yeah, and then absolutely. she walked, and then she walked out of the room it's, uh... <laughs> and I've never forgotten it. You yeah. know, it, it's, it's that business of, and I think that one of the things that's so profound about the passion story as it comes to us or the story of Lazarus last week and so on, the notion of, and I was once told by a fundamentalist when I said that one of the most powerful stories because of the possibility, the poetics of the story of Nazareth, of Lazarus, pardon me, this notion that Jesus was weeping is meaningful to me because of that. A fundamentalist woman in a Bible study said, that's not God speaking. That's the enemy convincing you. God is not weak. God is not weak. And I'm thinking, well, you haven't been reading the same text I've been reading. Yeah. I think, I think I, I agree completely with you. I mean, uh, we, we, whenever anybody says we you should always ask, well, who do you mean by we? But Who's the we? I, 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 I can experience that historically, especially in my early days, Anglicans were really uncomfortable with tears and any displays of emotion, but um, the tears shouldn't be dried up. No. They should be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. They should be embraced. They should be, somebody has to give voice to the tears. That's right. Someone has to allow the tears to be there. It's, it's the tears are going to lead us into possibly, just possibly, following the promise of doing the work to change whatever is going on whatever occasion the tears it's it's um tears are on on uh, uh, in the ancient days uh back in the second and third century tears were seen pr primarily as a gift of god mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think we would be far better served by understanding them as a gift of god because let's be frank there are situations in which if we if we're not crying if we're not moved to tears, you know, if we're not responding in an emotional way, if it is not disturbing our insides, if it's not disturbing our thoughts, if it's not yeah. disturbing our daily life, if we're haunted by it as we go throughout the day, if we're not, if that's not happening, we've just revealed ourselves to be louts. <laughs> Isn't that the <laughs> truth? So the last and, thing before, oh, sorry. Ahead. I was no, going to no. say, I, I want to ask you one more thing before Rob's going to have you to read for a bit before we finish. But the the other thing, and, and this is not going to be on on a script I sent you because it was a script I sent you had a mistake in it. But anyway, never mind that. Ian Ian can fix this up after. Take out my bit about the, the mistake. This I might there. just leave it in just for fun. Literally, just yeah. leave it in because it's a, <laughs> it's a question for Patty Graywack and not for you. But anyway, uh, but, but the question I did have for you is about um, – the reign of God, as you talk about it, as proclaimed by Jesus, the only acceptable coin is the gift. The only coin with any currency are lost coins, as referenced by Luke 15, 8 to 10. The only economics is the madness of expenditure without concern, referencing Matthew 13, 44 to 46. I wonder, picking up on that notion of, you know, we're talking about what, what the real import of something like Emmett Till or Jesus of Nazareth or the Armenian genocide or the Holocaust or the people drowned in the St. Lawrence in the last two days 
you know, and on and on it goes. Um, the currency is with the lost coins. I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that. Well, this is this is why I say that um, uh, for, for, there's no way that you can pay for forgiveness. Mm. It, 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 you cannot buy for you, I mean, and that's why um, any attempts at reconciliation in which mm. there's a monetary value attached to it, which is not, I'm not saying it shouldn't have a value attached to it, but we've got to be clear that when we attach a value to something, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's reparations in terms of uh, residential schools, or whether it's reparations in terms of the uh, reality of slavery, slavery in, yeah. in, in, in the Americas. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not, we're not wiping it away. We're not making it better. It right. is. So I'm not saying one shouldn't do that. But like there is no economic uh, reality. You're just not going to touch it. You're not going to come close to what that offense was. What there has to be is that shared experiential reality of what is going on within that. When you mentioned the the people, you know, in in drowned in the St. Lawrence, I couldn't mm -hmm. help but think of that uh, now iconic picture of the of the five year old Turkish. Yes. Yeah. washed up on a show yeah. was it Crete I mean yeah. it, the fact that these stories keep happening over and over and over again the fact that we're still we're finding if finally getting evidence of what the First Nations people have been saying to us for Decades. generations yeah yeah, yeah. we yeah. just still refuse to hear it that yeah. there are graves here the fact that you, you see these things noted over and over and over and over again which is to suggest to us that there's something that we're not allowing ourselves to see, and it's right in front of our face. We just mm -hmm. will not see it. We don't see it because to allow it to be seen, it's going to disturb us too much. It's yeah. going to upset the apple cart. It's going to get in the way of our plans, procedures, and processes. Yeah. It's going to get in the way our of, strategic of, plan. of the convenience <laughs> of our days, as opposed to the daily call of the of of the sacred of hospitality of of freedom upon our lives um it 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 so i i, I make an association by paying attention to lost coins that it's that madness is where you've lost a coin and you just tear your house apart mm -hmm. trying to find the damn coin mm -hmm. okay it's 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 not the specific action okay and so when I in the book talk about an event, it's not it's not the what of an event. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not sweeping the thing to find the, the, the coin, but it's what is going on within that activity. Mm -hmm. What's going on within that that causes you to keep looking and looking and looking and looking and looking for a coin or to leave 99 sheep behind yeah. and go find one lost one. Really? Madness. Madness. Cut, cut your losses. Yeah. Keep the 99 safe. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But we got to be honest. We are crazy enough, and yeah. <laughs> excuse me, we are crazy enough. And this is my my endless hope and prayer. We are crazy enough as followers of Yeshua to pay attention to the madness of leaving ninety nine safe and secure and going off to find one lost sheep. Yeah, because that's what we're about. Yeah. It is there is an inherent madness to the reign of God. And I get that a lot of people in the world will not get it, that they just think we're completely out of our minds. And we have to be honest. Perhaps we are. We because there is no guarantee that we're going to make any difference. Mm -hmm. There's no guarantee that we're going to make anything better. There's no guarantee that the church is going to improve situations. In fact, we got a shitload of evidence that says the church is going to do the exact opposite of that. <laughs> But we've got to be mad enough to to take that lure seriously of doing something, of giving ourselves over to the search, the continual search for the lost coin. Yeah. yeah. Um, time's running out for us today. Um, so to wrap up, we wanted to ask John um, if you could we could conclude with you reading a piece from the book. Uh, this is an introduction to a Pentecost uh, homily you gave in 2019. But we think it's a fitting way for you to close our podcast today with some context. So would you be so kind as to read that portion for us? Okay. 
I must conclude with a context, situating myself, at least partially, within life's complexities. For those who know me, little of this will be a surprise. But on the offhand chance that someone who does not know me hears or reads this, honesty requires this brief statement. For almost 50 years, I have chosen to be a part of a particular faith tradition, a path and a practice, a way of life usually known as Christian. For almost 40 years, I have chosen a particular path as an ordained priest within this way, ordained within the Anglican, Anglican tradition. During this time, I have honored and respected the traditions, the practices of this ancient way, open to varieties of rituals, rituals embodying a praxis, forms liturgical, spiritual, musical, pastoral, in both communal context and individual expressions. This path and practice chosen, respected, and honored is never to be understood as uncritical acceptance, but as a way of deep love, by which I mean a way of deep critique of that which I love, holding it to a standard that it will never meet, yet must never forget. This path and practice is a way always luring me, a way but partially understood, a way frustrating, yet not easily forgotten or left. Beyond this, I have tried my best to honor and respect the complexities of the world, as this is where my path and practice are lived out. Those who know me or who have heard me speak know that I raise many questions concerning God. Can you be a priest that questions God? <laughs> I know no other way. Those who know me or have heard me speak know that I am profoundly troubled by the capital G, God, <laughs> the capital obscuring, flattening whatever is astir within the name troubled by the language used to describe God, by the supernatural descriptors of God. What those who know me or have heard me may or may not know is that daily I pray to God to rid me of God, that with my troubles, many have declared me an atheist, that others are troubled by my letting the question of belief in God to remain unanswered, troubled, or at least confused by my statement echoing Jacques Derrida, that as far as being Christian, I may, perhaps, rightly pass as one. As one passing, may I say, I take seriously what is going on in and under the name of God. Hmm. Strangers at the door, perhaps the reign of God is John Marsh's book, and it is available now. And John, we thank you again for being part of the Vickers Crossing podcast. We look forward to talking about the next one coming up. So cheers. Not through yet. I believe John is John is a three, third. Uh, I, I feel like uh, you know, like it was who was it? Steve Martin and Chevy Chase, or Steve Martin and who, or Martin uh, Martin, uh, Martin Short, Short. Yeah. who have the contest about who's hosted Saturday yeah. Night Live the most. John is thrice. John um, is a thrice. I think John thrice, is up near the top. Yes, yes. I think the only yeah. other thrice person we might have is Diana Butler Bass. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. think you're. I think you're thrice, John. I think you're in. You're. You're very. You and Diana Butler Bass need coat jackets <laughs> well here, here here's the thing uh, 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 i don't want to interfere interfere with your programming uh for the future but get diana butler bass and me on the conversation on the same time oh, that'd be a yeah, great time there we go yeah, yeah and yeah. and uh yeah so the fifth book's coming out uh let me just what's it, it called a, do we have a title it's called afterlife question mark 
Yeah. Uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh, Ooh. and it's coming out. Know. Yeah. It's uh, actually in a few days. I think it should be available uh, pretty soon. Uh, Keep watching uh, Amazon, folks. John's book is soon be available. Uh, yeah, afterlife question mark, and afterlife is spelled after with a slash and then life question. Okay, mark. Hmm. awesome. Well, John, thanks a million for doing this. We really appreciate yeah, you. Well, I appreciate it. Oh, listen, you guys keep up the good work. Well, I listen to you guys often, so take care. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Yeah, you take okay. care. Toodle bye. All right. Thanks very much again, John. And uh, looking forward to chatting about his next book coming out shortly. But this one, Strangers at the Door, uh, Perhaps the Reign of God by John Marsh. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Wraps up another episode of our podcast today. And we want to nice to have our... Ian back, Rob. Oh, Woo! it is. I was just <laughs> thinking that as I was about to uh, wrap things up. So yeah. thanks for the reminder. So let's thank our sponsors, too. <laughs> yes, Ian of George course. Funeral Big. Home. Uh, where each life is celebrated and their sister company cremation london and middlesex both family owned and operated dave the diocese of huron a community where families and individuals from windsor to owen sound grand bend to port rowan come together to worship and serve and to molly made make your uh, healthy haven call molly made london today ian for sure. clean up that bloody mess behind you i'll get on I'm rob right henderson now. from holy trinity st stevens i'm kevin george from st aiden's and i just wish ian could clean up that God forsaken mess in his room. My name is Ian and I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna go do that. <laughs> Get to work. Kevin. Yes. Re remember, always look both ways. Before you cross the street, man. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks!